Mr. Mayor, thank you so much for being here in the studio today. Really appreciate your time. Thank you for inviting me. Let me start by asking you about SunRail. Um, do we know how local control of that line is going to look at this stage, practically speaking, when that handover from the state to local control happens? Generally, we do. Uh, there was an initial agreement between uh, the five local partners uh, being Orange County, Osceola County, uh, Seminole County, Volusia County, and the city of Orlando mm -hmm. in partnership with the state of Florida uh, to create uh, the corridor. Uh, we believe that the transition will take place sometime late 2024. How will it be run? Is Lynx going to have a role in that? Uh, it is undetermined at this time whether or not Lynx will be the managing entity. Of course, the corridor itself will always belong to the state of Florida. Yes. Uh, the managing entity uh, will change. And in other words, the operations, uh, the initial agreement called for that transition to have actually taken place in 2021. Right. Uh, but uh, the corridor needed to be complete. And until the entire 61 miles is completed with some data associated with the operations and the full cost of operating the entire 61 miles, the partners would not be comfortable with uh, making the transition because yeah. of the financial implications. And so that had to be extended. It was slowed down because of uh, COVID-related supply chain issues and yeah. some other things that had to occur. And you're talking about that extension up to Deland, correct? That is correct. Yeah. SunRail incurs an operating deficit, as we know. Are there enough local resources to fund it when it transfers from the state? Are you confident that it's going to be in safe hands? I'm confident that we yeah. will reach a point in time where all of the local partners will uh, come to an agreement about what the financial um, commitments would be from each local jurisdiction. Uh, because the state of Florida will continue to own it, uh, it is unknown how much money the state of Florida through the Florida Department of Transportation will bring to the table as well. All of that is something that has to be negotiated over time. What we're trying to do is ensure that all of the partners are comfortable with that transition. Uh, we are in discussions. In fact, today I hosted a meeting of the regional executive leadership team from all of those partners uh, to have a conversation about the transition along with the regional district secretary for the Florida Department of Transportation, Secretary Tyler, uh, and we have further conversations about the prospects of the Sunshine Corridor. And you think that that can get ironed out for that handover towards the end of 24? We want it to be a mutual uh, process and ridership uh, yeah. analyses still need to be done so that the local partners understand uh, all of the ridership yeah. implications and how much funding uh, will be derived from that. I would say that uh, when you look at the various transit models around the country, uh, in almost all of them, uh, they are, you cannot operate them solely based upon the fare box receipts. You have to have some federal funding, a state or local dollars to make these types of uh, operations work. And I definitely want to talk about that with regards to the Sunshine Corridor. You mentioned COVID and you also mentioned ridership. Lynx and SunRail have seen some ridership recovery since yes. COVID. It's not back to pre-pandemic levels, though. Do you think it's realistic that it can get back there, given the new work mode that a lot of people are in? Well, at the last uh, Lynx Board of Directors meeting, it was reported that for the week or two just prior to that meeting, uh, that for the first time since the pandemic, yeah. uh, the ridership had reached pre-pandemic oh, uh, levels. Uh, so. Uh, that's the good news. Uh, people are looking for alternative uh, modes of transportation that are cost uh, effective for them. And so we want to make certain that we improve uh, and increase the connectivity of our Lynx public transit system. Uh, we have a commitment in Orange County uh, for the next uh, five years. We are committing $100 million of Orange County general fund dollars uh, to improve pedestrian, bicycle safety, uh, lighting, and other features around uh, 
uh, highly trafficked uh, mm -hmm. intersections, in addition uh, to expanding the number of routes uh, that links uh, buses will operate within uh, throughout uh, the main corridors, primarily the International Drive uh, Tourist Corridor, as well as some of the other areas around uh, the county. Ground was recently broken on a new Pine Hills bus transfer station for links. It's kind of hoped that's going to be something of a, a community and, and transportation hub, right? I mean, that's something we've, we've heard from yourself and other local leaders. You've said you hope that SunRail one day can have a, have a stop there. Um, do you think this hub is going to improve that connectivity that you talk about? And do you think it's going to realistically make a dent in those very long commute times we hear about from people who rely on bus transit at the moment? There's no question. The $100 million commitment that I just talked about will improve the connectivity and the frequency of yeah. the buses uh, that run within the county. Uh, that will reduce the total uh, travel time for many of those who depend on buses. But we also need an expanded uh, commuter rail system here within our community uh, and then link the two. And then uh, thirdly, we need to make certain that we continue our efforts to build workforce housing in the centers of commerce so people uh, work where they live and that can cut down on the tremendous commute times as well. Well, let's talk about that um, rail network then. SunRail, of course, is part of those plans for a, a Sunshine Corridor that you referred to earlier to link up with Brightline, connect iDrive, the Convention Center. The Orange County Commission recently approved a special district around uh, Epic Universe. We'll talk about that first. That's predicted to provide, I think, $174 million uh, for infrastructure. How important is that body, and do you think it's going to make a significant difference? Well, Epic Universe is slated to open sometime in 2025, late 2025, yeah. and uh, it is believed that an additional 14,000 workers will be needed just for Epic Universe. That will certainly put a lot of uh, pressure on the transportation infrastructure sure. in the area just to get the workers. Uh, we know historically whenever these new theme parks open up, we see an increase in total visitation mm -hmm. uh, to our area. And that means more and traffic. That means more traffic. Uh, so because of that, uh, absolutely the, uh, the new uh, community development district that uh, Universal and the other landowners mm -hmm. have uh, profit forward, uh, properly it's called the Shingle Creek yes. uh, Community Development District. Uh, it is a district where the landowners within the district have decided to tax themselves in a special way to receive uh, certain governmental privileges as a, a, a governmental entity uh, to improve the overall transit and transportation infrastructure within the district itself. And uh, yes, uh, Universal was present for the meeting today. Uh, they indicated that they remain committed to assisting with a public-private partnership to help uh, reduce the cost of transit for our workforce here within the uh, greater uh, metropolitan Orlando area. The larger Sunshine Corridor project, there are various predictions about how much that might cost, uh, but it could be in the billions, according to some estimates. The federal government is likely to require matching, right? That's not unusual uh, from local sources, tax, private funding and things like that. Brightline told me recently it's willing to do its part to help fund that project. But without that penny sales tax that you pushed for uh, that didn't succeed at the polls, is there really a way to afford that kind of money? It would be very difficult uh, to do something that is transformative. Uh, yeah. But with this, we have to have contingency plans to be able to move the needle within the breadth of what we can afford to do. We're fortunate that Orange County is thriving. Mm -hmm. Our tourism is thriving, uh, now an $87.6 billion industry along. Uh, our hotels are thriving with a number of people who stay within the hotels. Our tourist development tax receipts are up. Our sales well, they were tax down receipts. just recently, right? Well, uh, overall, this year will be uh, a historic high. Yeah. Uh, so when you look at the in context of the entire year, uh, we will collect over $350 million in tourist development tax receipts. We've never done that before. Uh, and so this will be the first time that that will, will Your happen. Your comptroller, it seems to be 
quite conservative on these things, right? I mean, he's sort of urged the, the commission to be fiscally responsible. He's watching those numbers. I would say he's cautiously it. optimistic. Okay. And so that sometimes translates into, uh, yes, a conservative estimate. Uh, we have seen some slight uh, declines in the uh, year over year uh, in the tourist development tax receipts. But mm -hmm. to put it in perspective, uh, even within these last three or four months where we saw a decline, they still are within the top 15 highest months yeah. that we have ever collected tourism taxes over the 480 months, yeah. the 40 years or so of its existence. So to put it in perspective, they're still very high. But they were so high, that was not sustainable uh, for long periods of time. They're beginning to stabilize at this point. After that pent-up demand. Yes. When it comes to transportation, can you use any TDT dollars? Uh, there are very rare instances. Uh, it could only be used uh, directly in a tourism corridor. Uh, mm. For example, it there is was a tourism some, corridor. Uh, isn't I, it, would, I will tell you, for example, um, it was used uh, uh, near the convention center because yeah. to get to the convention center, you got to have a driveway to get sure. into the convention center. And uh, at that time, the, the, the controller. Uh, for the county and the legal team uh, came to the conclusion that um, for a, sh a short uh, entrance into the convention center, it was appropriate to use TDT mm -hmm. dollars on the roadway there. Uh, but uh, broadly speaking, uh, we cannot use TDT do dollars outside of what is specifically defined uh, to support uh, some type of expansion of that nature that, uh, that I referenced. But it uh, would be helping to expand tourism, correct? It runs so, through the tourist corridor. So in terms of if uh, when you get miles outside of the sure. convention center, uh, the interpretation has been that that is deemed non-eligible uh, for those types of dollars. Now, within the International Drive area, there is a, a community redevelopment uh, area, a mm -hmm. CRA, and the CRA within the district has also provided some funding. In fact, uh, the you know, corridor that uh, was uh, hotly debated, uh, the improvements around the Sand Lake Road, Kirkman yes. Road area, uh, the CRA is actually uh, going to, uh, there would be dollars expended from the CRA for that project. Uh, there was a lot of question a few years ago about whether or not Orange County was giving a universal $125 million to expand the, the Kirkman Road mm -hmm. uh, corridor, and uh, Orange County hasn't given Universal anything. Universal, the total cost of that road expansion at that time was estimated somewhere over $400 million, and until that road would be complete, you won't know the full cost. So it is still under construction. Uh, Orange County capped its risk exposure at $125 million. Uh, that was to support a road that the county was going to have to expand in either case, whether Universal was going to build Epic Universe or not. Uh, so we really uh, hedged our bet and capped our costs. And until Universal delivers the road, Orange County will not pay one dime. And at this point, uh, Orange County hasn't. But through the CRA and some other funding, uh, mechanisms uh, that $125 million ultimately uh, will be paid. You've just been having this pretty lively discussion about tourist development tax dollars. I think lively is probably uh, <laughs> one of the words that, that you might use to describe it. Uh, he hearing you that it's limited in what you can do with it, would you like those limitations removed? Because one of the frustrations you hear from a lot of people is, look, we get, we're the biggest tourist destination in the United States. Why can we not harness that to build some things that will benefit people, specifically transportation? Would you like the legislature to address the issue of how TDT dollars can be used by municipalities like yourself? Uh, one of the things during this upcoming legislative session that Orange County uh, has um, endeavored to support is the expansion of the eligibility to use tourist development yeah impact uh, revenues, uh, which is different from the tourist development the tax difference? itself. Uh, two different statutory definitions about uh, how those dollars can be used. And so the um, tourist development task force that I put in place mm -hmm. uh, to review 
the expenditures and make recommendations on how the county should prioritize the use of TDT dollars. One of the recommendations was to uh, look at and lobby the legislature to change the tourist development uh, or the tourist impact tax, I should say, not the tourist development tax, but the tourist impact tax. And so we're in those uh, discussions with the Florida Association of Counties looking to see if we can get uh, allies to support that expansion before the legislature. Don't know how that's going to turn out. Uh, quite frankly, I believe that it will be very difficult because there's only one county under the current definition of Florida law uh, that uh, meets the criteria, and that is Monroe County. And so what we will be doing is uh, asking uh, that other counties be designated by the state of Florida as a, a community or area of concern to the mm -hmm. state. And the reason why Monroe County was so designated was because of the disproportionate impact that um, that seasonal kind of uh, tourism they have in their area negatively impacts their overall infrastructure because uh, many of the residents who live in uh, Monroe County are only part-time residents. They, they're seasonal. They come and go. This is but the Florida you, Keys for people who may not know. This Florida Keys, yes. and they still have the burden of sure. having to maintain uh, that uh, uh, local infrastructure year-round. And so they were designated as a community of concern mm -hmm. as defined by the state of Florida uh, to uh, expand it to allow Orange County somehow to meet that statutory yes. definition will require a change in the Florida law. So we'll see how that works out for us. Uh, in terms of the overall tourist development tax dollars, what I will tell you is that the use of the tourist development tax dollars as uh, currently as it currently exists uh, is a tremendous asset for our community because um, because of the tourist development tax, we have been able to invest in community venues uh, from the uh, convention center to building uh, now uh, two arenas for the NBA to building the Dr. Phillips Performing Arts Center uh, to um, expanding Camping World Stadium and a number of other things but also our local uh, arts and cultural affairs small performance groups they benefit uh, from those dollars in other words it keeps a lot of people working here and whenever we have the opportunity to maintain those facilities that are community mm -hmm. assets, or what it does when we have a dedicated funding source to support those venues, it relieves pressure on the general fund, the, which mm -hmm. is a derivative of ad valorem taxes that we all pay, uh, taxes on uh, property values, commercial and residential. Mm -hmm. We use those dollars to be able to address all of the social needs of our community. And so when we look at the different funding streams that we sure. receive as a county, yes, when there's one that is strong, it takes pressure off the others, mm -hmm. and that is how we are able to look at our nearly $7 billion budget as a county uh, to uh, uh, adequately address the issues associated with homelessness and all those other things. But wouldn't it be great, though, if you as a leader could say, you know, those, that's a little weaker. We'd like to take some of those tourist development tax dollars and, and, and spend it on SunRail. That would be great, I, right? I work in the realm of dealing with reality, yeah. okay? We cannot spend you don't think that can be one right? dime more than what we take in. Yeah. And so uh, as the CEO for Orange County, the yeah. taxpayers entrust me uh, to look at all of the funding, the enterprises uh, that we have as a county and make decisions in the best interest of the county about how that works. Mm -hmm. And what I'm simply saying to you is that we are addressing the very issues that you uh, have brought up. We are yeah. addressing housing affordability. Orange County created its very first uh, housing trust fund since I've been mayor. It was one of the issues that I championed. Uh, and we are building workforce housing. Just last week, uh, we uh, broke ground on uh, Catch Light Crossings, which is a public-private partnership that uh, a workforce housing is going to be built in the tourist corridor, not far mm -hmm. from the convention center, 
uh, on land that has been donated by Universal Resorts of, of Orlando. Uh, but other dollars are making that a reality, including these uh, taxpayer dollars that I referenced from the Housing yeah. Trust Fund. So we are addressing those issues. We are addressing uh, homelessness in this community, and we're doing it through general fund dollars. We're using uh, federal funds. We're using state dollars. We're using private sector dollars to address those issues. So all of those things are being addressed. It's not like we're being uh, negligent and not addressing the issues. We are addressing the issues is what I'm saying to you. Yeah. Let's just bring it back to, to transit a second. And one of the things that I wanted to ask you about was bus rapid transit. Rail is pretty expensive as a form of infrastructure to develop. What about options like bus rapid transit with dedicated lanes and stations like many other cities have uh, around the country? Would that be a more affordable option that could be looked at in Central Florida? Are there plans to build up that kind of, in kind of infrastructure here? Well, part of uh, what we would have done had the penny sales tax passed yeah. was to accelerate uh, our investment in bus rapid transit, where we would have dedicated lanes where our buses would run uh, unimpeded by the normal traffic yeah. so that the buses would run on time, cut down on the travel time to get our workers to their final destinations faster. Sure. Yeah. We're still committed to that. Uh, but uh, we identified, uh, going back to 2021, a $21 billion deficit, a need in our community to yeah. address the transportation and transit improvements that were needed to make it safer for yeah. uh, everyone, to, to make it more convenient, to uh, create opportunities to take people out of single vehicle cars, to cut down on the damage that we do to the environment yeah. uh, when we infringe on environmental and sensitive lands, number, to right? air quality, to yeah. all of those things. Yeah. Uh, that $21 billion deficit today is even more than yeah. it was in 2021. And so the, in order to adequately address all of that, we needed additional funding revenues to address that. Unlike the federal government, we cannot run a deficit. Yeah. Our budget has to balance. We cannot spend one yeah. dime more than what we bring in. And to do something transformative in a growing community uh, will take uh, billions of dollars, yeah. as I have indicated. And since, um, according to the, cens uh, the census data, in the decade leading up to 2020, uh, our population in Orange County alone grew yeah. by 25%. And uh, with that type of population growth, yes, our infrastructure is falling behind. So we do need to look at multimodal solutions. Would you consider bringing back the idea of the, the penny sales tax at some point? One of the, the pushbacks at the time was we, we can't afford it at the moment. Do you think that's something you'd like to reintroduce as a concept? Uh, we are having those conversations. Uh, yeah. The first time that we can put it on the ballot again would be uh, for the general election of 2024. Uh, what I can tell you is that at this time it's unknown. Uh, if we advance it to the ballot, the Board of County Commission will have to make that decision by mm -hmm. late spring of 2024 in order just to get it on the ballot. Uh, the economy will play a decision uh, in play into the decision whether yeah. or not uh, we uh, advance that tax or not. Uh, we are seeing high uh, rent prices. Uh, the sure. indications are they're beginning to stabilize somewhat. But we've been working hard to diversify our economy, to get our wages up. The wages are going up within our community. We've been working hard to address the housing affordability issues. Uh, we've been working hard to uh, diversify our local economy with high wage paying jobs. All of that is kind of big picture that we're working towards uh, to uh, make it more affordable for people to live here. And so uh, in 2024, I don't know what the future holds. I don't have a crystal ball, but uh, I'm optimistic that our economy will be doing well. Uh, I can tell you that many economists have projected that we would have had a recession by now, and that didn't happen. Uh, that's the good news, and uh, being able to sustain uh, the momentum that we have with our economy is going to be part of, I think, a global uh, economic uh, picture, uh, and so we'll just have to see at this point. I wanted to finish off by talking a little bit about, uh, and something you mentioned a little earlier on, uh, pedestrians and cyclists. For whatever reason, we keep ranking fairly high in terms of pedestrian and cyclist deaths. 
Um, what is the county doing to try to, to fix that problem that, that sort of seems to reoccur year after year? It's in other parts of central Florida too, uh, but I wonder from, from your uh, government's point of view, what kind of steps are you trying to take to bring that number down? Well, we adopted a, a Vision Zero plan of action, which uh, our goal is to by the year 2040, we will reduce uh, traffic fatalities or serious injuries to zero. Yeah. In that 20 year time. How are you going to do that? That means that we would invest in pedestrian, bicycle, uh, safety related improvements, lighting improvements around the county. And so earlier I alluded to the fact that uh, we have, for the short term, working within uh, the budget that we have, uh, a $100 million commitment over the next five years uh, to improve those pedestrian and bicycle safety features throughout the county. And so we're going to move forward with that plan. And this, by the way, is on top of what was already programmed through our public works budget. In addition, we're working through Metro Plan uh, of uh, Greater Orlando mm -hmm. to uh, improve the pedestrian safety as a community. And Metro Plan has been uh, the recipient of a $3.8 million Safe Streets uh, grant uh, to uh, work collaboratively ac across uh, the region to improve uh, pedestrian safety. And so that plan is in place. And then Orange County, here in the UCF corridor, in fact, uh, had done a, a pedestrian and bicycle safety analysis. Uh, we have um, allocated $13 million uh, to improve this corridor here in the Alafaya University uh, area. And so I'm really optimistic about what all of that brings. And then, again, across the entire county, we're looking at uh, very strategically working with uh, the jurisdictions, the municipalities, and others to bring improvement to the area. And are you still committed to those last mile options? Because I remember when scooters were adopted here, there was a lot of controversy about that and safety and so forth. Are you happy with what you've seen? And do you think they play a role in the transportation puzzle in this community? In terms of the first mile, last mile uh, yeah. types of options, we have to look at uh, the broad array of potential uh, options. Um, the personal scooters is one way to look at it. We have created an ordinance within the county with regulatory authority uh, to regulate those who want to get into that industry. Uh, but also, what we have done is uh, taken a look at uh, emerging uh, innovations and in technology. Beep is yep. one of those uh, companies that's here within our area that has been doing some uh, piloting and studies out in the Lake Nona area where they have autonomous vehicles that are moving around a small uh, bus types sort of, of geo fenced area, yeah. yeah, in a geo fenced area. Uh, they are now in the Creative Village in downtown Orlando with a partnership with the city of Orlando. Uh, we are exploring the potential to put something like Beep uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, mass uh, transit vehicles in the uh, International Drive corridor. Uh, so that is uh, emerging technology. We'll see where it takes us, uh, if we can make uh, the cost and the price points work for all of us. You've talked a lot, finally, about transportation in your time as mayor. How does it rank as a, a priority for your time? And, and when you finally leave the role, what would you like to see? And can you be confident that you'll be happy with what you've achieved? Uh, I can tell you that I will be happy with what uh, we have achieved, what we will achieve. Uh, in terms of the ranking, it's one of the top priorities that we have. Yeah. Uh, the fundamental reason government exists is public safety, to keep the people safe. So we have invested heavily within our fire and sheriff's office and corrections and uh, other public safety related functions sure. within the county. But transportation is one of those because it speaks to the quality of life mm -hmm. that we enjoy as a community. Uh, it's the right thing to do to take care of those who are low wage earners within this community. So I am 100% committed to that. It, even with expanding uh, public safety and transportation, 
it creates jobs, yep. construction jobs, well-paying jobs, engineering jobs. It creates entrepreneurial opportunities. And so I am committed to that uh, because of what we have been able to accomplish with this $100 million initiative that we have underway with the Housing for All Trust Fund that we have put in place with the commitment uh, to acquire uh, over the next 10 years, uh, $100 million worth of preservation lands, uh, our sustainability plans are in place. Uh, I'll be able to uh, say that we uh, have been able to move the needle and accomplish great work by working uh, across the region, working in a partnership with the private sector. Uh, is there more to be done? Absolutely. Uh, so for the remaining three years that I have as mayor, I still put that uh, transportation uh, solutions as one of my top priorities. And so I'm going to stay focused uh, on it. Uh, sometimes you have uh, things that happen uh, that slows down progress, uh, but then you have to look for those opportunities to pick it back up at an appropriate time. Well, Orange County Mayor Jerry Demings, really appreciate you coming in today. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Yes, sir.